Can you guys also warmly welcome Vicki Gillum with me as we're going to do a little table talk here. As we get into our final message in the Surrender Series, you guys been enjoying this Surrender Series in Psalm 23? Yeah, three of you? Great. I'm so glad to hear that. No, it's been, it's been so wonderful to be able to um, kind of follow the shepherd, and, and I, I'm really happy that you're up here. How long have you and, and Ted been, been with us? We've been attending New Hope since the August before the roof fell in at Farrington. Okay. So a you, few years. Yeah, you know, quite a few years, and your heart has just such servant hearts, and you guys actually serve as one of our, our regional pastors. I don't know if you guys realize this, but we've divided the whole island of Oahu up into specific regions, so there's a pastor assigned to every area where you live, so we can help you connect with small groups and life groups. And we have an upcoming uh, small group, so if you're interested in, in starting one or attending one, you can talk to Vicki or her husband Ted, and they'll, they'll be happy to help connect you with that. Um, but we've been talking about the shepherd leading us through, and I love how David ends this beautiful and powerful psalm. In fact, you can take your notes out or uh, in, your, in your bulletin or on your, on your app, and it says this in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely your goodness and your faithfulness will pursue me all my days, and I will live in the Lord's house for the rest of my life. And I love this because David is talking about how we don't know what the future holds, but we do know the one who holds the future. But the key to that is actually surrender, isn't it? Because uh, we have to actually let God hold our future by surrendering in the present. And David talks through all this about surrendering our will, our ideas, our plans to the shepherd. And I was listening to something that you were sharing recently at our our gathering and a success with significance business gathering and the story you shared about how God had you work with this um, co-worker really reminded me of what it is that David's trying to teach us here. Why don't you share with us about that? I worked for seven years at a very busy medical clinic on the mainland. I was very, very thankful to be given a job to work for a Christian doctor who had a very good reputation in the community. What I didn't realize at the time was that I would be working with a coworker who also took care of a very well-known doctor in our community. And she and I would have a little bit of a disconnect. And it, it was a stressful relationship probably already, probably from day one. Wow. And you didn't even know why? Not really exactly. There was never a one-time incident of anything that truly went wrong or as far as I could tell, but there were these little pricks, little jabs, little messages, and it built a wall. It was these things that continue to offend. I think we can probably all relate with that. We probably all work with someone like that, or maybe we are (laughs) that person, not pointing any fingers, but I think all of us understand the challenge of having to surrender to the Lord in a difficult work environment. What would happen next? After a course of time, I realized that my coworker was not speaking to me. I didn't know exactly what I had done. We were so busy, we had to stay on task every day with our job. We just had to stay focused. If I was to address her, she would answer. If we were in a group setting, the conversation would continue. But I knew in my heart that I would not be acknowledged. I would go to work every day realizing I would be ignored. Mm. This went on for about a year, probably longer. I didn't really count the time. The Lord gave me an anchor verse at that time. It was Psalm 18, verse 28. You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. And with my God, I can scale a wall. Mm. And I would have to remind myself as I walked to, the, to my desk every day, the reason that I'm here is I'm here to be a blessing. And I had to put that on every day. Yeah, and there was a, quite a literal, relational emotional wall between you and your coworker that you couldn't explain. And I hope you guys caught that, her, her anchor verse. Did you know she didn't have to read that? That's because she went to that anchor verse every single day, every time she would go in, into work. It, it just became a part of her because we're either going to surrender to the waves of someone else's emotions or we're going to surrender to the anchor of God's word that is immovable. All of us have 
situations and relationships in our lives where it's up one minute, down the next. You don't have to go with it. Regardless of what the other person does or how they respond to you, if you can anchor yourself in the word and the truth of God, that'll keep you stable even when the people around you are anything but stable. And so I'd really encourage you, as Vicki was exampling, to, to find a couple anchor verses that you would just repeat, that you would write out, that you would pray even as you're, you're going into work or even in the middle of your day to really help you to remember, I am going to think like Christ even in the middle of a difficult situation. So what was God asking you to do? Into our um, tenure there at the, at the clinic, our clinic and our sister hospital came into financial duress. There had been talk of possibly even closing the doors. An outside company came in and bought us out. And one of the new requirements for us at the front desk was we were to call our patients every day to remind them of their appointment the following day. And of those of you who go to the doctor, you know that happens. With us being so busy, we were not in that practice. As I would call my patients every day, I realized that it was gonna be a struggle for my coworker because her load was higher and greater than my own. Okay. It was at that point that the Lord started to speak to me about calling her patients as well as my own every day. When the Lord starts <laughs> speaking to you, you hear it up here first and then it takes a while to register. You have to get the two to connect. Mm. It was an act of surrender yeah. to be able to even make the decision to move forward that. Because the that. last thing you'd feel like doing to someone who's rude to you every single day is to take their workload and do it yourself. When I first presented that to her, her response was, she handed me the paper, turned her face back to her screen, and kept working. And I took that and said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so in that place of surrender, you had to surrender to God's command and not her reaction. And that's a really big key because a lot of times we'll obey God as long as it works out on our end. But in this situation, even though she was totally blowing you off, you knew I wasn't surrendering to her. I was surrendering to God. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so good. And so uh, how, how many calls are we talking here? We're talking about 30 to 50 calls a day. Wow. On top of your regular workload. Yes. Yeah. And how long did this continue? Probably several years. Who knows? <laughs> and over the course of several years while you're doing your calls and her calls, how many times did she thank you? Not once. No acknowledgement. But wow. the credit has to be given to the Lord that the lines of communication were reopened. And that was huge to know I could go to work and know that that icky feeling would not be there. Yeah. Yeah, and scripture describes that as coming in the opposite spirit. Even though she had a right to not respond well, sometimes we have to lay down our rights to do what God says is right in the moment, and that actually ended up building a bridge between you and her in terms of communication. I left that position because an opening came up for me to work side by side with my husband. We remained in that community for about another year and a half. We then moved to Arizona. While we were there in Arizona, she calls me up one day and says, hey, my husband and I are coming to visit. We want to touch base and let's go have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> A call you thought you would never, ever get. Wow. <laughs> we got together and we had a great time. It was very refreshing. Wow. And it was very restorative. Wow. And so you guys, uh, the relationship continued even um, on Facebook after that. We became friends on Facebook. And just a few years ago, I started noticing that she's attending church and a good church. At yes. That. I that's thought, awesome. wow, how could that happen? Yeah. What happened? I don't even know what happened. At Christmas, I noticed that she had posted pictures on Facebook of taking her whole medical team with her to the Christmas program. And I thought, isn't that huge? Because I prayed for a lot of those people. A lot of those coworkers were now going to church there. because of her. Wow, mm -hmm. that's incredible. But the, probably the most significant thing is right before Christmas, she sent me a little note and messenger said, Vicki, I'd really like to get your daughter's address. You see, my daughter and her husband have a little boy. He's not quite two years old. His name is Tate. And Tate was diagnosed with leukemia last year, last summer. At Christmas, he was right in the middle of his chemo treatment and praise God, we can say that his last treatment ended last Monday Yes. of six long months of treatment and process. I sent her the address. A week later, my daughter sends me a picture of the note. 
that she received in the mail. The note says, I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Your faith in God is amazing and inspiring. And attached to it was a check, a donation, a love gift of a, a substantial amount. Wow, that's incredible. There's, there's no way that you could have known that this woman who was very much your enemy all those years ago would now be all these years later ministering to you and your family in your time of need. Absolutely. Only God, only God could do that. And that, that's the seeds, right? The seeds mm -hmm. of surrender. There, there's a scripture that said one plants, another one waters, but God brings the increase. Had I not made that decision so, so long right. ago, yeah. who knows what would have happened. I am in the benefit of being able to see some fruit mm -hmm. come, mm -hmm. but there are many of you who are walking the path of surrender daily and you haven't seen the fruit, but I mm. promise you the Lord is pleased with your surrender and he's pleased with your obedience. Wow. And there will be a reward that will blow you away wow. when he's ready to reveal it to you. Can we receive that word, you guys? <laughs> so good. I wonder if, would you mind if we prayed for Tate? Would you thank guys you. just extend your hands out towards Vicki? God, we just thank you for Vicki's testimony, God. And we thank you, God, for Tate, an opportunity to, to lift him up to you, God, even before his two-year uh, birthday. God, we believe that he is a, a son of promise. And God, that just like his grandmother, God, he is going to share his story of Jesus and your faithfulness to him. God, we thank you that leukemia has no hold. God, we just pray for complete healing, that there will be no uh, return, God, to this, that we'll have no more hold over his future. And God, we just thank you in advance for the story that you're going to write through Tate's life that's going to lead many, many people to come to know you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can we thank Vicki one more time, you guys? Thank you. Isn't that so good? It's so good, and, it, and yet it's the opposite of what we ever feel like doing, right? That's what I'm saying about, that's about surrender. None of us are going to ever feel like surrendering, and yet it's when we surrender that we're planting the seeds of surrender, and the harvest will come that will literally change our future. We don't know when. We don't know how. There's no way Vicki could have known that surrendering in that office all those years before would have resulted in a harvest of relationship and blessing for their family in a time of crisis. But I, I believe this could be that day. This could be that moment where you and I surrender the things that we've been holding on to and we will see a fruitful harvest to come in years to come. And that's really what this, this first point is. You can fill it in your blank there that you and I need to let go to let God change our future. Now, we've all heard let go and let God. That's a, that's a common phrase used in church. But what's it unto? Well, it's so that he can change our future. We are letting go right now so we can let God change our future. And by holding on to it, we are preventing God from changing our future. We're trying to stay in control of the future even though none of us actually see it. How much more sense does it make to surrender our present to the God that actually sees it all, past present, and future. And he really wants the best for us. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know the one who holds the future. And this idea of letting go and surrender means we've got to actually let him hold it. And this is certainly the case that you see as we're going to spend a little time with Moses and Exodus, the book of Exodus. Moses was trying to take his future in his own hands, right? He knew that God was going to use him. He wasn't sure how. He tried to fulfill God's calling on his life as a prince of Egypt outside of God's timing and tried to be the deliverer of God's people in his own strength and ended up killing an Egyptian officer and running for his life as a murderer so that he wouldn't get killed himself. Fast forward 40 years, he's now a shepherd. And he thinks this is his lot in life. Then he comes across a burning bush as he's chasing after a, a lost sheep. And God speaks to him through the burning bush and says, I am. And grabs his attention and redirects his future. It says right here in Exodus chapter 3 verse 10, Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God. Now, this is true of all of us, isn't it? 
It was true of Vicky. It would be true of all of us. When God asks us to let go of our present so he can change our future, most of the time it's not going to be something we want to do. It's going to be something uncomfortable, something frustrating, something way outside of our comfort zone, that the, uh, serving our enemies even. They, we're not going to feel like doing it, and we will protest to the Lord, saying, no, 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 no. And, and Moses didn't just protest once or twice, but five times, if you read through in Exodus chapter 3, five times he says, God, God, I, no, 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 I, I can't do that. Who am I? I, 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 I stutter. I can't speak for you. What am I going to do when I show up to Pharaoh? He's, he's going to have me killed. Well, how can I even go to the people? They, they think I'm just a shepherd or I'm a murderer. He had one reason after another to protest, and yet God doesn't really pay much attention to our protests. He still calls us to our future. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. By the way, that's a great anchor verse right there if you're looking for one. It reminds me of when Jesus sent the disciples out into all the world to make disciples. He said, verily, verily, truly, I will be with you even to the end of the age. How is it that you and I can do impossible things? Because we don't do them alone. We do them with the God of the impossible. So he comes up with all these reasons why he cannot. And God says, no, you can because I'm going to be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. No, I love this. Catch this. You and I see in a finite perspective. All we can see is what's right in front of us. But our God sees infinitely past, present, and future. It's all present to him at the same time. So even while Moses is having a hard time picturing how this is even going to happen, God is literally saying, I can already see you and the delivered people standing at this mountain worshiping me. It's already done. All you need to do is walk into what it is that I've already prepared for you to do. Now, a lot of times when God is, is asking us to surrender, like Vicky was saying, we don't know what it's unto. We don't know the result. We don't get this clear prophetic picture of the harvest that will come from the seeds of surrender. But can I just encourage you to know this? Whether you know what it's unto or not, can we know this? That if God is asking you to surrender your present, it's going to change your future for the good. He is always going to fight for your best future if you'll let him. If you'll trust him. And it's always going to happen at, a, at some particular moment where, where your story changes. For, for Moses, it was a burning bush. For Vicky, it was this call list that, that she had to surrender to the Lord. You know, for, for David, it was after his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51 when he falls down and he lays his life back before God again. For Jacob, the schemer, and in order to become Israel, he had to wrestle with an angel in the middle of the night, and he walked out of there humbled and with a brand new name and an identity. For Peter, you know, open mouth, insert foot Peter, he, how did he become the leader of the church? It was at the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts 2 when he yielded to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and changed him from the inside out. And what about Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was on the road to Damascus when he was going to, to persecute some more Christians at the the light of God blinded him and he had to surrender his life, surrender his present so God could change his future. Now, most of the time it's not these burning bush moments. Most of the time it's not these blinding lights. Most of the time it's maybe a story like Vicky's or maybe a sermon like this. But you, if you surrender in this moment, you will trace back the fruit of your future back to this very moment right here, wherever you're at, wherever you're at watching online right now. This is that moment of surrender, but so why, why don't we? If we know it's unto our good and our future is going to get better the moment that we surrender our, our present, why, why don't we do it? Well, because we don't want to let go of our I am not list. We, we have all, all of them have, all of us have it. Moses had one. I am not a good communicator. I am not a good leader. I am not, and it just kept going and going. And until you and I can surrender our I am not to the great I am, we won't actually surrender at all. What's your I am not list look like? Well, maybe you can relate to some of these things. I am not proud of my past. I am not that close to God. I'm not sure, actually, that God even loves me. I'm not really able to change. I'm not a good example to follow. I'm not trusting God with my finances. I'm not confident in sharing my faith. 
I'm not right reading my Bible enough. And it goes on and on and on. But listen, I've got good news for you. You've only got one thing on your to-do list today. Surrender your I am not list to the great I am. You surrender that list, and we all have one, whether we've written it out or not. We all have an I am list that lists immediately the moment God asks us to do something. If you can give that over to the Lord, this will be your burning bush moment. This will be the time when you're able to step into that which God has already called you to. Remember, when he walks up to the burning bush, God says, hey, Moses, take your slippers off. This is holy ground. What was he saying there? That which has brought you here won't get you there. These shoes of victimhood, of sin, of pain from your past, that which you have been wearing all the way up to this point, it may have worked up to now, but you got to leave it here. Because just like this ground, you have been made holy. Holy means to be set apart for the purposes of God. Whatever brought you here to this moment this morning, you got to take it off just like you would your slippers. Leave it down at the feet of God and walk into the preferred future that God has for you. And here's, here's the thing, is that sometimes in order to go forward, we actually have to go back. In fact, you can fill that in your second blank. You can go back to go forward by faith. And I know it seems like an oxymoron. It, does, it doesn't even seem logical. What, how, how does that work? Go back to go forward by faith. Well, sometimes God will call us back to some things we'd rather not face in order to prepare us for the future he has planned for us. And this was certainly true with Moses. Five times he argued with God about not being the one that God would use to lead his people. Ten times he had to go back to Pharaoh. And it was the same thing every time. He would say, let my people go. Pharaoh would say, no. Moses would say, okay, here comes plague number one. And then Pharaoh would say, please pray that God would remove it, and then I'll let your people go. He'd say, okay, and then he would, and then Pharaoh would go, no, you're not going anywhere. And over and over again, he would lie to his face. He would reject him. He would threaten him. And over and over again, Moses had to go, eventually you're going to be like, I don't even want to go talk to the guy. How many of you guys prefer to talk to people who reject you all the time? Yeah, me neither. And yet he says specifically right here, hey, you got to go back. Exodus 9, 1 through 3, go back to Pharaoh, the Lord commanded Moses, tell him this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, the hand of the Lord will strike. He had to keep going back because of what God was preparing him to do in the future. There's some of us that we cannot move forward until we go back to what it is he wants us to face. I was up in Eugene, Oregon this past week. I'm on the board for our New Hope Christian College up there. And to go there every other month for our board meetings, it gives me a chance to spend a little extra time with our senior pastor, Wayne Cadero. And while I was up there, I asked him for a couple of minutes of his time. And I just said, Pastor Wayne, here's what we're talking about this week. And could you share with us a story from your life of when God had you, like Moses, go back so you could go forward into all he had for you? Take a look. Pastor Wayne, it's so good to be with you here at oh, New Hope Christian College Studio. My Studio. honor, my honor. Yeah, and you kicked us off so well in our, our Surrender series, our study of Psalm 23, mm -hmm. with how the horse has to surrender to the rider back at your ranch. And so I love that we can kind of help finish up this series together as well. We're talking about surrendering our future mm. and how the psalmist says that he... Uh, will we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that goodness and mercy will follow us. But sometimes surrendering our future means what we're surrendering in the present is something we'd rather hold on to. And sometimes it seems almost illogical, more like a regress than a, a progress, because God calls us to go back in order to go forward. Yes, right? yes, yes. And uh, we, we were looking at uh, the story of Moses and how God had to tell him to keep going back to Pharaoh because none of us like rejection, right? And right. so he's getting rejected once, twice, three times, five times, and God says, go back to Pharaoh, go back to Pharaoh. And sometimes we have to go back in order to go forward 
How have you seen that at work in your own life? Well, you know, God always um, gives us the prerogative to make choices with our future. And yes. he wants us to. The scripture says the mind of the man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his mm -hmm. steps. Mm -hmm. So it's like we can plan, but God's the director. So if he likes our plans, That's he good. goes, good. If he doesn't, not good. <laughs> and we get to surrender to his yes. directorship. And uh, so I remember going up a hill once. Uh, they had these back turns, these turn backs, they call it, because you can't go straight up a hill. You don't have enough power and propulsion right. to do that. And so what they do is they build or construct the road in a way that winds back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I remember going up this hill in uh, Montana and we were going back and forth, back and forth. And I thought as we were going back, I, I saw the road that I just came <laughs> on and I'm paralleling the road that I just, you know, uh, rode on. Yeah. And I thought, what? We're going backwards. <laughs> But funny, it's like sometimes when we're going backwards, we're actually still progressing mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Though the direction is different, the progression and plan is still the same. Yes, yes, and I thought about that even with Moses having to go back 10 times to this man that um, was threatening to kill him, murder his people, and how that was actually preparation for his future. That in order for Moses to lead God's people to the promised land, he was working something in him even more important than what he was doing through him. Yeah. And God kind of did that with you. You didn't even know, but when God called you from Oregon back to Kilo, yeah. you had a specific assignment, yeah. and God called you back to go forward. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, well, there was a little church there that uh, was shutting down, and there were only at about 20-some people. And so it came under a certain district of our denomination. I was a district youth pastor at that time. And being from Hawaii, I was asked, would you go back and, and close that church down, get its records and find out what they have as far as property and disperse it to another nonprofit? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, they were in debt quite a bit. So they said, shut it down and, and then come back and bring the records and we'll- uh, This thing's done. Done, yeah. done. So I went there and talked to the people that were left and I was sitting in uh, Liliokalani Park and I thought, God, I've got to get these records, and I'm not sure. And, you know, I was young. I was 30 years old. Okay. And I'm shutting a church down. It's like, oh, I hate doing this. Yeah. And so, but my plan was to do what they told me to do and shut it down. Sitting there on the bench, God comes out of nowhere and changes direction. Mm. And he says, I'm going to give you now my direction. And the reason uh, you came here was to shut it down, but it got you here now I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna put something else in front of you, but I got you here so you could see the church. And the reason I brought you here is because you're moving here <laughs> and you're gonna take the church. It's not done, it's just beginning. Did he knock you off the bench basically? You're like, Well, yeah, I didn't what? think, I thought, this is not, it's, this can't be God, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and, and he said it again and again and again. And uh, I went home and I said, honey, I, I told Anna, I said, I, God's, God's changing things on us here. Wow. And God had been preparing her as well. Mm. And so oh, what our, yes. And sometimes, you know, John, our, our plan A is God's plan B. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. our plan B is his A. Ah. And if we don't turn around, we may miss the future that God had intended for us. So thank God for some of the turn backs because it makes us um, realize that God's ways are always better than ours. Yeah, so you, you move little Amy, little you know Aaron yeah. and, and Anna, and you guys all move to Hilo. And, and I don't know if you ever stopped to think about it, but when you first told me that story, I thought, if you hadn't gone back, we would have never gone forward with what New Hope has now become as this worldwide movement. We None of this would be here. I wouldn't be able to pastor this amazing church at, at Sand Island, the the 150 some churches that are connected directly to this New Hope movement, all of that was traced right back to that moment with you and God in the park. Yeah, yeah, and that's where God says, sometimes you have to go backwards, go back to where I've called you. And then he, almost like in the Old Testament, uh, redigs the wells. Mm. And sometimes we think they're done, they're covered up, they're finished, that's our past. And God says, well, I'm just gonna take you back. I'm gonna reopen certain things again. And it's the water's gonna be fresh. Wow. It wow. won't be stagnant. So what would you tell our, our New Hope Ohana that are 
they're maybe they're feeling that same challenge of the Holy Spirit in the season of transition and change. And maybe they're resisting to go back to some things because maybe it was a place of failure, a place of pain, a place of sorrow, but the Holy Spirit wants to lead them back. So, so they'll go forward. How would you challenge them? Yeah, I would say, you know, going back and digging up um, junk isn't what God is no. saying. Um, what, what he's saying is this, uh, you have, you will have a past and sometimes God's going to have you revisit that to rethink about it, but to rethink about it only in a with a new algorithm, a mm, new mindset, okay. so that the past, you start thinking about your past in a way that you start making it work for you rather than against you. Uh, and you've been thinking in a way that it's working against you, and you're plagued with that. And God is saying, revisit that only because I've reopened it, and there's fresh water that can come from that, not stale and stagnant water. And the second thing is he's saying, as you visit some of these things, uh, I'm going to build in you courage to face it Ooh. because you will never conquer it until you face it. Moses had to face Pharaoh with courage mm. in order to conquer that mentality of slavery. So God isn't saying go back as a slave. He's saying face the slavery so that she can overcome it. And we'll have to go back. But finally, the thing that God is saying is this. Uh, make sure that when you anchor your life, do not anchor it to your past. Mm. You anchor your life to your future. Mm. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not for your calamity, but for your mm. future, for your betterment, so that you might have a future and a hope. It's for your welfare. It's for your shalom is the word that they use. It's for your shalom, for your peace of mind, for your peace of heart. So he knows the plan. So even when you're on a turn back, remember this, even though it seems like I'm going backwards, I've anchored my life to my future. I haven't anchored my life and myself to my past. Mm. Then you can visit the past, overcome it, be courageous enough to conquer it because you've anchored your life to your future, not your past. Well, Pastor Wayne, I think on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you for saying yes to God in that park on that day because all of us are here because of that moment of obedience where you were willing to go back to go forward and i believe that our best days are ahead of us amen i do too thanks pastor Thank you. you guys thankful for our senior pastor so good so good we are not to anchor ourselves in our past but in god's future for us and ultimately our future it's not even here on this mortal coil. Our future, that all of this is preparation for, a preview for, a practice for, is a new heaven and a new earth through Jesus Christ that we will be welcomed into. That is our future, which means this. Okay, if, if this is not home, and I've been made for a heavenly home, and Scripture says Jesus is even preparing a home for us, then, then while I'm here, if this is where I'm going to learn the most, in preparation for eternal life, then I can't hold back. I've got to go all in. I've got to go big. You've all heard it said, you know, go big or go home. But what we're listening this morning, learning this morning is we got to go big to go home forever. And in fact, you can fill that in in your final blank there. We've got to go big to go home forever. We have our forever home and this ain't it. This world is not our home. This is practice. This is showing up to the practice field in preparation for the big game. God is saying, don't hold back. Give everything you've got with the time that you've been given to prepare for the eternal life that I have for you. When the psalmist writes, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, what's he talking about? He's talking about our forever home. He's talking about you and I in an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is all just prep for that. And I don't know about you, but I want to make sure everybody that I know also goes home with me. Amen? I don't want anybody here. I don't want anybody in, in eternity apart from God. I want them with me at the home that God is preparing for them. And the only way that's going to happen is if you, got, you and I don't shrink back. We don't, we don't play it small. We don't try and fit in or blend in with the crowd around us. No, no, that's, that's not what God's called us to do. He's called us to go big. And how do we go big? Because we see ourselves the way he does, as citizens of a different place citizens of a heaven that we would see ourselves the way God does and you can see that here after 10 plagues Pharaoh's finally relented he's releasing Moses and the people 
They're walking out as the, as the Egyptians are showering them with gold and jewels. They're walking out victorious. And look how it describes them here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 51. So all the people of Israel followed all the Lord's commands to Moses and Aaron. On that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like a what? How about that? God saw them like an army before they ever fought a single enemy. While they still saw themselves as slaves, God saw them as sons and daughters. Where they still saw themselves as just barely escaping, God saw them as already conquering. He was working out in them a different identity. He wanted them to march out of Egypt by going big. No, no, don't cower your head. You walk with your head high because God fights your battles for you. He did all those plagues. The Israelites simply had to obey what it is that God was asking them to do. And if you follow this story through, you see that what God is working out, trying to work out of them, is this Egyptian mindset of, oh, we're just slaves. We're nothing more than that. And God has to spend year after year to help them to not anchor themselves in their past, but rather in his future for them. And he calls them an army. Do you see yourself the way that God sees you? Do you see yourself as a victim or victorious through Jesus Christ? Because God sees you conquering, not conquered. He sees you taking the promised land, and the promised land is really a metaphor for the fact that this is not our home. Our promised land is in heaven. So while we're here, this is training to work out the old mindsets and go big into the things that God has asked us to do. Don't limit what God is about to do through you based on what it is that you've already done, because he wants to do a new work through you. Don't limit what God's about to do through you because of what you think you can do. This is not about what you and I think we can do. This is about what we know our God can do through us. You see that changing of the mindset there? A lot of times we think so small and we forget how big our God is. And our God wants to do something massive through our lives. And it comes down to this moment of surrender right here. Will we see ourselves the way that he does? And a lot of us don't because we see ourselves through a, a false image. And it reminds me of, you know, our social media is all about image. And this funny example of like every year when they do the 10-year challenge, you guys saw this recently on Facebook and, and Instagram, you're supposed to post a picture of what you look like in 2009 and then what you look like now in 2019, right? And it's kind of funny to look at how much you've changed. And so I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'll play along with this. So I posted a picture of myself from 2009 and I just thought, wow, I've... I've uh, <laughs> I was hitting that buffet line a little too often, um, you know, and, uh, and then I started working out, or right, eating my veggies, and, and uh, you know, kind of watching, watching what I'm eating, and, and then I posted my picture of 2019, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to brag, but <laughs> that's kind of good, you know, to be able to see the progress that I've made, I just don't, from Rake Man to Aquaman, it's not a bad, uh, not a bad 10 years, just don't tell... Jason Momoa, that I <laughs> use his picture. But we, we, we project a false image out there because we don't actually like our own image, right? When we look in the mirror, we don't see what God sees. We don't see all our faults and our failures and our shortcomings, right? And yet God is saying, hey, 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 you were made in my image. You were made in the image of the great I am. You're not junk. You're not an accident. You're perfect in his sight, He sees you as an army. He sees you as sons and daughters, not as slaves. Do you see yourself that way? I I remember it was back there in in the Diamond Head room. Well, it's it's not the Diamond Head room anymore as we prepare for our new entrance. But uh, back when it was a room, we would have our staff meetings back there when I was an intern here about 16 years ago. I remember one particular staff meeting, Pastor Wayne walks in. And he says, hey, we're running out of room at Farrington High School where we used to meet, so we're going to start some satellite sites around the island. And I'm putting together a team, and we're going to do uh, Max Wilkins and Eric Robeson, and John Burgess is going to be our front lines director. And I'm like, wait, wait did, did everyone's like, hey, good job, that's great. And I'm like, did he just say, 
I don't even know what that is. Like I was literally here one month as an intern. I was still figuring out what front lines was or how to do a program. And now I find out that I'm going to be on our first church plant out of the main church. And I'm like, hold, whoa, whoa, hold on. And we hadn't had any conversations about this. There was no like, hey, why don't you know, do you feel like, no, it was just like, I'm thrown in on the deep end. Right? Pastor Wayne was like, hey, no, you will learn, but you're going to learn on the job. OJT, right? On the job training, which is really what God was doing with the Israelites. He was calling them an army, but they would spend the next couple of years learning how to be what God already saw them as. Pastor, I saw myself as an intern. Pastor Wayne already saw a church planter. Do you see yourself the way God has called you to? Don't wait till you feel like stepping out. Don't wait till you feel like going big. God is saying go all in because I see you that way. I wonder if you see yourself the way God does. It's not in your notes, but it's up here on the screen. 1 Peter 2.9 describes you this way. You are a chosen people, not an accidental people. Not I have to settle for these. No, he chose you. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Have you ever seen yourself that way? Do you see yourself that way when you look in the mirror? Because that's how God sees you. No, not just the person next to you. I'm literally talking to you. You are chosen, royal, special. The mouthpiece that will declare to a world in darkness, here's how to find the light. That's you. That's you watching right right now. That's how he sees you. No wonder we're supposed to go big. We serve a big God. It's given us a big assignment. And to shrink back or to be anything less than the big thing that he's called us to is to miss out on everything that he's designed us for. And I would just pray that before you leave today that you are surrendering those false images, those false hindrances, those things that that are keeping you back from being all that God has called you to be because the moment that you take this to heart and you say, yes, God, I'm going to go big for you, guess what happens? The enemy comes on strong, right? People of God walking out, marching like an army. Woohoo! we're free. Then all of a sudden someone says, what's that? Ah, it's Pharaoh and his armies, and they're coming on strong, right? And then they go, what's that? Ah, and it's the Red Sea right in front of them, and how are they supposed to get across? And then they look to Moses, and they're like, ah, you know, just look what you've done. You've let us here a die. There's a, we're literally between a rock and a hard place here. We've got Pharaoh and his armies behind us. We've got an impossible sea in front of us, and there's no way to solve this. God, where are you? What happened there? They immediately went from victorious to victim within 2.5 seconds, right? And that's what happens. You and I were all like, yes, God, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to go big for you because I believe you called me to something bigger. And then we, so the moment we get outside there, ah, right, it all, yeah, just everything comes in. But I got good news for you. Remember this. David finishes the psalm by saying, surely goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all my days. That word pursue is very unique. It's only used this way once in the entire Old Testament. Normally that word pursue is used for your enemies chasing you, which is exactly what was going on with the Israelites. And if we're honest, a lot of us feel like we're running our every day, running from something from our past. And the Lord is saying this, goodness and faithfulness are chasing you. Goodness and faithfulness aren't going to let you out of his sight. Your God is with you wherever you go. You can run, but he's not running from you. He's running after you. And why is that good news? Because, yeah, we all got enemies chasing us. But if my God's chasing me, guess who is between me and my enemies? My God. My God's got my back. That means I can focus on my future. If my God's covered my past, that means I can have confidence in my present to step forward in my future. And if you know the the biblical story, 
that army was coming on strong and God dropped a firewall, a wall of fire that the, the, the armies of Pharaoh could not get past. And as if that wasn't enough, the God who was the rear guard was also their forward God and, and split the ocean in half so that every man, woman, and child could walk through. The God who did that then is the God who will do it again. He's the God that split seas. He's the God that fights armies. He's the God that leads us to freedom. And that's the God that goes big for for us so we can go big for him and there's no reason to hold back anymore we don't got to fit in we don't got to make sure that we look like everybody else no we were never meant to look like anybody else we're a chosen chosen people royal priesthood holy nation set apart to declare the wonders of God and all it takes is that in this moment right here you and I would surrender our past so we can walk into his glorious future let's stand and pray